Oh, wow. And look at that. Carol. Oh, <laughs> Carol is our uh, celebrity. Uh, Carol's our celebrity presenter today. And uh, we're really excited to hear about this amazing, cool work that you've been producing. Great. Okay. So full disclosure, this isn't as much about technique as one would think. It's really about my saying that there's so much information out there and there's so many exciting things to do um, that I'm hoping people will kind of follow this trail a little bit and um, start messing around with sculptural form. So before you do any mosaic, there's four really important questions. This is 2D or, or 3D actually. Is the object being used for a substrate stable? That's important. Even if the answer is, I don't want it to be stable. I did it in the tide, right by the tide, and I want it to be washed away. You still have to answer the question, is it stable or not? Is it going to do what you want it to do, as in dissolve or be solid, right? Is the substrate suitable for the environment it will be displayed in? So for example, if it's a wooden table and you put it out in the garden and it gets wet, it swells, cracks, falls apart, probably not suitable. Are you using the right adhesive for the substrate, the tessera and the environment? And when I use the environment, I meant the environment it was gonna be displayed in, but more and more we should probably be answering the questions, meaning the larger environment as in the earth as well. Um, that's something that I'm just really beginning to think about in my studio practice. And then is the tessera suitable for the final use? So for example, if it's going outside, it has to survive a freeze and a thaw cycle, will the tessera do that? So for this talk, I'm really only focusing on the first two of these four questions. Is the object being used for a substrate stable? And is the substrate suitable for the environment it's gonna be displayed in? So one of the first of the four things I chose to kind of focus on, found object mosaics. And here's a very simple example of found object mosaics, right? This is memoryware, and um, there are found vintage jugs. They're very stable. I found it an appropriate adhesive um, for techie heads. It, in this case, I used Carabond and Carolastic from the Chicago Mosaic School. But there are any number of, of adhesives that will work, no grout. Um, and this next one I just throw out, threw out here because I really liked it. Sorry, bonus slide. <laughs> but found object. <laughs> and, um, you know, in this case, it's a Lancer's Rosé bottle for indoor, not outdoor. Um, because if you put this outdoors, well, scale-wise, it wouldn't work anyway, but you don't want it to go through a freeze and a thaw. Okay, what happens if the thing that you're covering is not stable? Well, you can stabilize it, right? So here's the, um, a lot of people have used this project and um, it's actually a wonderful sculptural project. I highly recommend it as an exercise. This is the shoe project. And um, what you can see on the left is a finished shoe. And on the right, you can see this particular shoe was stabilized with rigid wrap. Um, for people who are interested in this project, which I do recommend because it really forces you to look at the interior and exterior of a form and to really uh, reckon with all the sides, right? Sculptural forms, top, bottom, inside, outside. Um, to get a really in-depth instruction on how to do this, um, a, the book that I actually used initially was Mosaic Renaissance. Um, by Laurel Sky, and she has some very nice, this is from her book, um, explanations on how to do it. She actually recommends um, either rigid wrap or I think she meant epoxy sculpt in the description, but um, you know, you'll be able to see. Um, let's go. Also, again, I didn't have any good examples of my own work to show, so I, uh, blatantly stole from an existing book, Modern Mosaic Interpretation from, from the 20th Century by Tessa Hunkin, whose work I really like. She's an English mosaic artist. And the example from the book on the right is made from 
stacked, um, stacked pots. So here's the example right here. So she's combining existing forms in a creative new way. Um, and I really like the detail that she used. I thought those hands actually were kind of brilliant. And the you can't really tell from this slide, but that little head is an upside down perfume bottle. Um, it's a very cool little project. And the book has some very nice projects in it. So, you know, I believe it's still in print, but even if it isn't, I do know that there are uh, examples on the, you know, on the used book market. Um, then there's also, let's just say, you know, you're not, you can't find the form that you want to express your idea. There's also mesh and wire with some kind of stabilizer. So an example of that, um, here's a piece I just actually finished this summer, one of my many COVID pieces. <laughs> and this is a 3D piece. It's very simply made. Um, and here is a close up of it. I wanted to create the illusion of a flexible um, piece. Oh, good Lord, sorry about that. Of a flexible um, substrate, something almost fabric-like that was suspended from a nail. So the materials I used, very simple. It's the meshed three sheets of that little mesh that you see on the left-hand side and some, some um, mosaic and glass tile mortar. I just got this at Home Depot and a sheet of plastic and some newspaper. So that's really simple ingredients. This is what the first thing looked like. I had four, I think three or four squares of this mesh. I mixed up a batch of thin set. I slapped the thin, so let's say carefully painted or slapped depending on your style, a layer of the thin set on the mesh and then draped it over plastic and newspaper to get the shape that I wanted. And so you can see this is really not that complicated, right? Here's an example of what this particular project looked halfway through. I had my fake hanging, hanging device on the top. I had my actual hanging device already installed before the mosaic. And you can see, see the little, um, like the little screws on top of the big circle of pebbles. Here's a close up. Okay, can you see it now? Okay, that's the top. That had to be carefully covered with the mosaic. Um, and because those little screws came up a little bit, I actually just used a slightly flatter rock to cover that up or little pebbles to cover it up. And this is what the hanging device looked like from the back. Okay. It was basically two D rings, a nut, and then on the top I used uh, washers to, keep, to hold the screw through so they didn't get pulled through. Um, another example of a piece made using the exact same technology is a piece by Carol Tinkleman. And um, I really liked this example. She was playing around with two things at once and I think it made a great piece. She was exploring Roman uh, Greco-Roman border patterns, and she wanted it to be, um, you know, as if it was a sheet of paper, something ephemeral. So she first made her mesh substrate, curled up the edges, and then this is very often very hard to do. She made that really rigid, symmetrical. Well, they're not that rigid. All right, that careful border border panel turn and make the curve. So. I like this piece. And then I like the way she framed it in the shadow box and covered the whole thing with thin set. Okay, so this piece, this is an old piece of mine. And this is again, really simple. It's just window screen, wire and thin set. And here's some examples of what those structures look like before they're covered with mosaic. Um, and you can see the, there's a half done one in there that I threw threw in just for, to show you, I'll do a close up of that in a minute. So you can make um, hollow forms, three very three dimensional forms, kind of wispy flat forms, and um, they're very light. And if you have any sewing skills, basically I'm just sewing the metal mesh together and kind of treating it like fabric and kind of, you know how fabric is on a bias, you can pull it certain ways. I'm pulling my mesh and my screen around in those ways to help me get the form. 
And here's a close up where you can see basically this is mosaic, but it's kind of a fibrous project, right? I'm treating the mesh like fabric, I'm sewing it together like fabric, and then I'm covering it with a thin set to get a sculptural form. Okay, so this was a challenge. I got a commission and I designed, I actually presented the piece, um, the little maquettes made out of clay, thinking, oh, they'll never pick that form. I had presented maybe four or five forms. And I was like, oh, they'll never pick that form. And then of course they picked the only form I hadn't actually figured out how I would really make if they picked it. So I had to do, it's a large, it's a, mm, three feet across maybe, two and a half to three. It's really heavy now because what I had to do was figure out how to make this open bowl shape that would have to be able to stay outside with two bumps, one on the front and one on the back. And you'll see how and why later. And so I first tried to carve it out of foam, realized that wasn't working, and then reverted to my fiber roots and made it out of wire mesh. So you can see I literally cut out paper, well, you can't see the paper part, but I cut out a pattern of mesh, then realized it wasn't stable enough, tried to reinforce it with some more wire, realized that it held up the form nicely before I put the Paltaya on it. And I'll talk more about what Paltaya is in a little while. Um, and then had to face the fact that if I just put Paltaya on it, which is the stabilizing material, it was gonna collapse. So what you can see here is I'm using a mesh, which I then had to stabilize, uh, foam balls, and, and I had to, um, figure out how to stabilize the whole thing so it didn't collapse. So here's problem solving 101. I went and got a wok. Oh no, the wok's too small. So then I had to go get some um, flashing, aluminum flashing for roofing. And I cut it up with my metal shears and hot glued it all the way around my wok and made it big enough. So then I put my wire thing in my wok. And at this point, I was a little crazy, so I stopped taking pictures because I wasn't sure it was gonna work at all. So there's a vital shot missing. Pretend this is the shot that, you, that isn't in here of me covering the wire and the foam with Paltaya. And so we're skipping to the middle. So you can kind of see the concrete of the Paltaya, which I, as I said, I will talk a little more about. Paltaya is a stabilized concrete form. So what I had to do was place a layer of that on both sides of the wire mesh and then totally cover the foam with it as well. And here's me when I regained my sanity, I am um, attaching little glass globs and vintage glass grapes to the center of the um, stabilized mesh flower. And here you can see now, it's resting on a pillow, so because if it rolls off the table, I'm going to be hysterical. And I have cut um, a stained glass um, to surround my center because I really want it to look like it's growing out from the middle. And this seemed like the most efficient way to do it. I cut larger pieces and then kept cutting it down so that it would make the curve for the inside of the flower. You can see it's pretty thick, right? because it's basically a Paltaya sandwich around mesh. And if you look at the edges, you can see that's two pieces of stabilized Paltaya, which is, as I said, a concrete material stable, um, which has a lot of additives in it that, that make it, um, you can use, use it like clay and in thin sheets. Um, and then this is what the center looked like after I got it all cut. Um, I used thin set and then grouted. This is what the back of it looked so looked like. So I had a little bit of an issue because I had a bulge in the back and a bulge in the front. So at some point I had to turn the walk over and put the flower on the back of the walk. I have to tell you one of the most handy things in my studio in terms of needing, you know, when I have to have like reinforcement, both for clay and sculpture is walks. Don't throw out that walk, that metal walk, or, well, I'm not even gonna tell you how to clean, but you know, those that walk I use over and over again. So this is the back of it. 
And then here's a little close up of the PVC pipe that I inserted into the center so that I could thread it on the pole. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that coming up. Um, basically, it's sculpture on a, on a little PV pipe, PVC pipe or flower lollipop, right? Okay, so that's, I whizzed on through that. And okay, so weedy board is something that a lot of us are used to. You don't have to use weedy board. You can use, there's other brand names. Um, basically what the weedy board is, um, is polystyrene center with two layers of mesh, one on the top and one at the bottom, and a uh, thin set on the top and bottom, okay? And we tend to use it for flat projects, but I took a, I took a look at the weedy board um, site for people who make upscale bathrooms and figured, found out that they build these really complicated forms simply by scoring the weedy board and bending it. So I thought, well, if they can make a shower out of weedy board, like a shell shaped curved shower in, in, for a gigantic human, I can make a little arch out of one. So I followed the directions. So here's a little arch. And here's all the steps I used to make the little arch. So again, um, I actually did pay attention to home ec, believe it or not. You'd never know by the rest of my life, but I made a little paper pattern. <laughs> so in the beginning, in the front is my little paper pattern. And what I did in the little paper pattern that was wrong was forgot to accommodate the width of the weedy board. So, you know, I had to figure out that actually I had a half inch. So I had to adjust the length of my arch. Oh no, of the bottom. So it wasn't hundred percent perfect with my little paper pattern the first time, which is why I like to make maquettes. But I figured it out. I figured I was a half inch off. And then on the left, you can see what the little arch looks like after I have taken uh, the pattern, put it on the weedy board, cut it out and glued it together. Okay, so the glue really isn't stable enough. I only added that because I tried to teach this and what I realized was that a lot of people in the class were having a hard time holding the sculpture together before we put the mesh on. So if you just glue it all together with a little weld bond before you put the mesh on, the weld bond's really not sculpt, not structural. The weld bond is holding it together so that you can get the structurally important parts done next. So in order to make the arch, I scored the weedy board on one side, but didn't cut all the way through and just bent it. And you can see, I had to get a significant number of scores on the top of that arch on the left in order to get a nice curve. And I just kept scoring it every half inch or every inch until I got the curve I liked. I could have made a circle, I could have made a complicated S curve by scoring different sides. It's once you do it once, and I highly recommend just taking a piece of weedy board and scoring and bending just for the hell of it, you'll be shocked at the forms you can make with no power tools. All you need is a utility blade and a sheet of weedy. And if you're the kind of person who likes to plan, maybe a little pattern. The one in the middle, you can see I covered the exposed edges and the cracks in the scoring just using mesh and thin set. And then the one on the right, you can see what it looks like after I mosaic the whole thing. So it's all I used to get from a flat piece of weedy board is weedy board, a utility blade, mesh and thin set. Okay, here, this is an older project and I'm sorry, it's not a great photo. Um, I had to, I actually called Mainline Center for the Arts because this bench is, is there. And I said, can you run out to the backyard and take a picture for me of that bench that the Mosaic Society of Philadelphia helped you make almost 10 years ago? And they said, sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, since we made it for them, they have put it so that the back of the bench, you can't see. And that was actually the best part because it's a full tree. So if you come up on this bench, it was made to be seen from the front and the back and the back was what you're supposed to see first. So there's a full tree 
this is a community project. There was a van that went out into the community with um, Alice Bowman on it. She's a member of the Mosaic Society, working with um, you know people from different communities, making these little face forms, these flower parts, these leaves. And then at the end of a season of going out, uh, all the parts came back and we made this bench. And the bench is made from extruded weedy. That's why it's in this section. So here you can see it from the front, the sides. So what you're looking at from the side, hold on to the form in your brain of the side, because I'm going to show you the extruded weedy form. So there's the bench, and then we attached a thick piece of weedy in the back for the tree, the poor missing tree, uh, which is there, but you just can't get to see it anymore. Um, full disclosure, this bench has been moved twice with a forklift, has been outside for almost 10 years, and has exactly one place where it needs to be fixed. That's impressive in terms of a mosaic that went through a major building project and got dragged around when the whole thing was just a muddy lot. And the form that this was made on is this, which you can order from the Weedy Corporation. They make high-end bathroom and spa extruded forms. So you can see how basically we just bought the forms, the art center, um, and this is many years ago, but the forms were actually donated by Mohawk Tile and King of Prussia. And then we slapped a big sheet of weedy board to the back and it was a major community project and it was great, we loved it. And, and all that's on there is enough mesh and thin set to cover up the exposed weedy parts. Um, most of the weedy is already treated and ready to go because all of that gray is thin set and mesh. So that's just a reminder when you're planning your community projects, you can go 3D, you don't have to stay flat. Okay, carved foam with an ectoskeleton, right? Um, I actually did not come up with this technique at all. I owe everything, well, not everything, but most of what I know, I'm gonna show you the Sherry Warner Hunter technique. Um, she teaches great workshops. Unfortunately, uh, I think she's discontinuing her concrete camp in Bell Buckle, Tennessee. I always told people go take that concrete camp and um, I'm not exactly sure what her changes in life are, but she um, has wrote that she probably won't be teaching anymore from her firm at in Bell Buckle, but she is going to be teaching nationwide. So when you see something, I know she has something coming up not just nationwide, at the Hacienda de Mosaico in Mexico. If you don't want to or can't find one of her workshops, um, she has two really good books, Making Concrete Garden Ornaments and Creative Concrete Ornaments for the Garden, uh, which if you follow along in the steps, definitely you can do this. So I, I think that's you know good to know. And I am literally following the instructions. So uh, this is again a commission for the same person with the flower. So I had a little itty bitty maquette at the little flower, the little clay bird, um, the tiny little clay bird, which you can see is broken because I dropped it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but what I did next was figure out um, the profile of both the side and the top of the sculpture. I got my foam together and all my foam tools and I began carving into the block of foam. So there's lots of ways to look at sculpture, you know, additive and reductive. This is reductive sculpture, which means I started with a block of foam and I carved away. So I'm using a hot foam wire here. Um, so I basically melted out that center by cutting it with a hot wire. That's the little tool on the right. And I'm over carving because you want it to be more, you need it to be smaller and more reductive than the final mosaic. You figure about a half inch by the time you're done with most layers of thin set and or adhesive and your tile or tessera. So I've carved away, carved away till I got a bird. These are the tools I used. 
And then um, I needed to figure out how was I going to get the bird on the pole. So here I am using three quarter inch uh, PVC pipe and that little cap on the top of the PVC pipe is what keeps the pole from going through the top of the sculpture because the sculpture gets heavy, pushes down on the pole. So that little cap is really important. These are the tools you need. It's not that, you know, again, I kind of like to be a minimalist, not too much stuff. Okay, and basically what I'm making here is bird on a stick, right? So I took that hot wire and cut my bird in half. And then I cut out, scooped out a little uh, channel in the center of both of those birds, put my PVC pipe with the cap in there, used adhesive, so this foam lock adhesive I had left over from one of the workshops that I used. Honestly, I don't think I would use this project again. Product again, it's excellent, but it is a spray adhesive. And now at least you can get adhesives that work better without spray. I've had this for a really long time. Um, you know, so now that I own it, I'm using it up, but I would go for a more ecologically uh, correct glue now. But if you happen to have this hanging around, this is a great thing to use. So I glued up the two sides of my bird, closed it around the pole, tied it together so my bird dried on the pole. Okay. Now I have basically bird lollipop. And I have then cut the, um, cut the PVC pipe. This tool is the best. I don't even know what to call it. You go to Home Depot or wherever you buy your stuff and you say, I need to cut a PVC pipe and make them give you something like this because this is how easy it is to cut the PVC pipe. I figure out how long, like I wanted two or three inches below um, the foam and it's literally, I tightened my hand four times and the end of the pipe fell off. It's a great tool, it's cheap. I love tools that give me control, right? Because you know, you get so little control in life. <laughs> this is a great, <laughs> great design tool. And so now here you can see, I have bird on a stick that goes over a pole and I have to decide what to do next. Um, and in this case, I chose Peltaya. Full disclosure, I made a mess, right? All that scraping away of the foam is a horrible, mess. There is foam everywhere. Okay. And this isn't even all the foam everywhere. I threw out the first batch of foam and then I remembered I should take a picture of it to share with everybody what a horrible mess it was. One hint is I do as much of the cutting and scraping inside the garbage as possible. As in like, I'm literally leaning inside the garbage and cutting and scraping. And the reason is the black plastic bag sucks up some of those little balls and holds onto it for me. Also, moisture is your friend. So when I go to clean up my hands and arms, because it sticks to me, I spritz myself and then roll it down. Because if you're dry, especially if your skin's dry, all those little balls stick to you. So try and like, literally, you look ridiculous. You're literally hanging upside down in the garbage and then you're spritzing yourself, but it works. Okay, now the exo exoskeleton of your choice. I, I'm gonna actually show you two different examples. For this piece, I chose Paltaya. Now, I've been experimenting a lot with Paltaya recently. I don't wanna talk about it too much now because this is, if I run over, Suzanne Dobb will kill me. <laughs> I, I will not kill you. I'm sure everybody is really getting a lot out of this. So. Continue on. All right. Well, let me just say, I promise not to run over. So, but paltaya.com has wonderful videos. They also have uh, PDFs that you can print down that are really, really handy. I basically taught myself how to do this using those videos and handouts. Free education. If you call them up and reach out or text them and reach out, I didn't call them, I texted. They will answer questions. Um, I say it's really, I like the product um, and they offer excellent education. So paltaya.com. 
Um, the ridiculous thing is that to get the Peltaya to stick, you need to cover it with aluminum foil. So I covered my bird with aluminum foil. Now it looks like dinner, right? <laughs> so I covered it with aluminum foil <laughs> and then I covered it with Peltaya. Oh, and the other thing with Peltaya that's a bit of a pain in the ass is you have to let it cure underwater. And that cure is a minimum of five days and a maximum of a month for, for total strength. So because my bird is hollow, it floated, right? So I had to put it in a, I had to put it in a container and weight it down with rocks to keep the bird under the water. So I did. And this is what it looked like when it came out. Now the piece isn't done. It's in my studio, I'm ready to go. You can see what the bird likes, looks like on the stick. You can see kind of what my palette of blues will be. It's a blue bird. Um, you know, I'll share the information when I'm done with it, which full disclosure, again, I'm pretty busy right now, a month or so. <laughs> but um, this is how I, got, how I got the bird in the shape that it's in now, ready to go. And I'm just gonna use thin set on it. And the beak, oh, I lost a little beak. I made a mistake. I should have made the beak more prominent. Um, and I lost a little. So I'm gonna build it up with probably, um, I could add Peltaya, but I actually, in this case, I think I'm going to use epoxy sculpt, which also works outside. Okay, so I just saw a really wonderful piece in a show that just came down my, by my friend, Claire Brill. Um, and she graciously shared these slides with me last night at the last minute. And because I said, I love the piece. And also she sent me these construction slides, which show you the alternative way of forming an ectoskeleton, exoskeleton around those foam forms. And I really like looking at multiple ways artists do things because you really learn a huge amount um, about problem solving. So here's Claire. This is her beginning of working on a piece called hollow. And instead of using, she's using a different kind of foam, still foam, this is an insulating foam. She's laminated the layers together using an adhesive, carved out the foam that she wants, the form that she wants, I'm sorry. And then, because remember how I mentioned you need it to be you're gonna gain about a half inch when you add everything all the way around to your piece. Claire didn't wanna gain a half inch. And so she reduced the volume of her sculpture by a half inch all the way around. Okay, so that's what all of those cuts are on the right-hand side. She's reducing the volume of the piece by the half inch and still saving the original form that she made exactly. She then, covered the form using thin set and wire mesh, right? Going back to what we talked about before. So here's that mesh and wire. I'm sorry, not wire mesh. It's, um, oh, it's not wire. Claire. Fiberglass, fiberglass adhesive tape. Thank you very much, Claire. <laughs> fiberglass adhesive tape. Fiber tape, yeah. So, and you can see here, she's mixing that, that, um, thin set pretty thickly. It's a sculptural material, a sculptural form. And Claire, don't go away too fa fast. So am I correct in saying that this is a technique that you learned um, not from Sherry Warner Hunter, but from the Chicago Mosaic School? Correct. Yeah. And the, the wire, the fiber tape, like here, it looks like it's going over the thin set, which I did in some places because I had to make some adjust adjustments, but really it goes primarily right on top of the foam. And then the thin set goes on top of that. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> so I'm going to go now to this. This is, her, she's making a piece called Hollow. This is the piece that I saw in the show called Loss. So this is a very beautiful piece. And, you know, the lighting in this in the show that I saw, I didn't love because I couldn't see in the hollow, but the hollow that the, you know, the indentation was more mysterious with this lighting. So this is a piece I really, if you get a chance to see it in person, I highly recommend. I found this a very um, uh, uh, moving piece. I'm going to show you 
This piece is called Loss. And I'm going to show you a close up of the center, um, which here is very well lit, but, but really recedes, right? So you really have to work to get in there visually when you're looking at the sculpture. And, and I think that's part of the um, emotional resonance for me, this darkness with this heart going in. Um, anyway, there I go. I talked about emotion. Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking I was going to talk all about um, practicality. Okay. So I showed you four ways to make things theoretically, but actually any of these are just vocabulary words and it's how you use them that makes things interesting. So sometimes you could just freestyle, right? So this is a little detail from a piece that um, it's pretty small. And basically I made it out of paltaya on top of a foam skirt with um, wire armature limbs and balled up Reynolds wrap um, head and body volume, okay? And here's what it looked like when it came out of the water. Okay, so you can see the bottom half, you have to imagine that's a, a foam. And then there was an armature going up the middle around the arms and everything that has volume was gotten there by Reynolds wrap and I covered it all up with paltaya. This was the first time I used the paltaya, it was my test. And this is how I found out that I couldn't cover the wire, um, the, the upper arms that were being held over the figure's head with the paltaya without putting some Reynolds wrap on there and I hadn't left enough room. So I had to wait till later and solve the problem. Here you can see the exposed um, armature wire. I had to solve the problem by coating it when I added the beads using epoxy sculpt. So um, this was kind of dress design going back to that paying a little attention in junior high school to um, whatever, to home ec. So I, I kind of designed the dress, et cetera, on the little form. And here's what um, she looked like when she was done. And then the one on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, is the one I'm going to do next, but it has flaws. The arms are a little too thick, right? So I'm gonna have to change the design of the dress to make it look like she's got big sleeves <laughs> and, um, because it's all about learning, right? So, the whole thing is problem solving. And sometimes things go wrong. So I'm going to show you my disaster. Okay, so this isn't a disaster, this is the front of it. So I started this piece many years ago in one of those concrete camps and I used all the recommended materials and everything was going fine. And then I put it in my garden and it stayed there for a year. And then someone came by and liked it and bought it and put it in their garden and it stayed there for another year. And then this is what happened to the back. Why? Okay, I know why. Because I did the front in this workshop and then I took it home and then a new product came out and I decided to try it. And I wasn't making it for anybody else. It was just a test, right? Because I was going to put it in my garden. So the adhesive that I used to cover the back was the new product versus the old product. It did not react well with water. Water was absorbed into the piece, ran down towards the bottom, froze and forced all the pieces off. This is what failure looks like, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so this is not usually, and so now this is in my studio. What I did was I took back this flower and I had to give the customer that red flower in its place because you have to stand behind your work, right? So I did. So now I have learned that that product did not work. <laughs> I do not recommend it. And sometimes things fail. And you know what? That's okay. Because failure is a learning opportunity and this is a journey, right? So I'm totally cool with that. And this was gonna be the end of my slideshow. And then I thought that's kind of depressing. And if you don't like pithy sayings, forget it. That's gonna be very unsatisfying.
So then I decided to say, just go for it, which also sounded kind of unsatisfying, although I meant it. So here's a friend of mine. This is Barbie Hennig's blue orb from a long time ago. I just always loved it. It's very satisfying. And sometimes you can just keep it simple, stupid, and it's absolutely beautiful. And that's my presentation. <laughs> what, what a fabulous presentation, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your process and your uh, failures and your successes. It's so cool that you document as you're working. And boy, we all learn so much from you. Thank you.